Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to University United Methodist Church. We are so excited to have you here this morning worshiping with us. Please rise as you are able as we sing Build My Life. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. remain standing as you're able as we sing Good God Almighty. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. There ain't no way you'll ever let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Tell me, is he good? Somebody that you're not like sun in the morning. I know you're gonna be there every day. So what on earth could make me feel this way? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Tell me, is he good? He's good. Tell me, is he God? He's God. He, he is, is good God, God Almighty. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Praise him when the sun goes down. Praise you in the morning. Love you in the noontime. Love you when the sun goes down. Keep praising. 
You may be seated. Good morning. It's uh, my privilege to be the pastor and welcome you to this worship service this morning. It's good to be able to always start the day thanking God for the night and the awakening of the morning, but particularly on the Sabbath. If you're visiting with us, I would invite you to sign the registration pad or fill out the piece on the bulletin. Let us know who you are and how we can continue to serve you as you journey this earthly life. This morning, we are celebrating uh, Native American Ministries Day. That's one of the ways the United Methodist Church says we're all woven together and we care for all people, not just for some. That's what's remarkable, one of the many things that's remarkable about this denomination. So you found in your bulletin a, a special offering envelope and a little uh, pamphlet that gives you more information. We are uniquely, uniquely blessed in this greater area by having the only Native American fellowship in the conference, the only one across the river, up the hill, in East Peoria, Day Spring United Methodist Church. And so half of all the monies that are collected on this day, half of them are remain in the conference and used for ministries that will continue to uplift the Native American ministries. In addition, on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of this week, if you have any energy whatsoever. Now, I, I say that because I know there are many who would say, I'm on my last lap. There isn't much I can do. But if you have any energy whatsoever, I uh, encourage you to come either on Thursday or Friday or Saturday. There will be people to designate where you can go and help, but we are trying diligently to clean out areas so they can become usable here at university. So from nine to three on those days, you are invited to come on Saturday, um, there will be, well, Friday and Saturday, there will also be an opportunity if you just want to work outside to come and do what's needed to uh, just not clean up the outside, but clean out the inside as well. It's a dual opportunity. And on Friday, if you choose that day, on Friday, guys, on Friday, you'll have lunch provided. So there you go. I would invite you to turn to the screens and join with me in the opening prayer. O oh star abiding one, eternal spirit, your eye beholds with love all people you have made. Fill us with your spirit of love that we may share the burdens of humanity as a sign bearing the cross of Christ. Hear our prayers for the native peoples of this land, that they may find justice and dignity due to all your children. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. As you are able, as we sing, morning has broken.
You may be seated. Let us turn to uniting heart and mind with God's spirit as we join in the call to prayer. Today, O oh God, we pray for ourselves and our nation as we remember injustices suffered by the native peoples of our land. There are scars left behind on our hands. Look on us with compassion, great spirit, and help us to restore what is lost renewing the earth which you have entrusted to us as we realize justice for all. In these moments of silence, I would invite you to offer your prayers to God Almighty. Hear these words. God loves us and frees us from all that we do and desiring to turn away from the transformative power of believing. God hears our cries and our questions. And God remains present. In the name of the rising one who came, who comes, and who is to come again, the heavy weight of doubt and our questioning can be turned over to him. As we come to you in prayer, O oh God, we offer our thanks that you are always present to us, even though there are times when we're not present to you. We thank you that you call us by name, even though there are times when we take your name in vain. We're sorry for the times when we have not been present to you and for all the times when we have looked for you in all the wrong places. We ask that you would instill in us a sensitivity to your presence as we find your glory and in the majesty of the sunset and in the smile of a child. We are thankful that when we find a human need and fill it, you are there. We offer gratitude for the courage of martyrs who confront conflict with nonviolence. Help us, likewise, to search for options for a better way. And within this community of the faithful Lord, awaken us to the opportunities for ministry. Inspire us to pray for peace 
and for healing in a broken world filled with broken relationships. Expand our horizons that we might know that wherever you are, you are there. For even as we seek you, you have already found us. And help us, O God, to live so that when we meet you face to face, we might hear you say, you are my beloved child. With you, I am well pleased. O Lord, hold us together in your loving arms. Help us to see that in these moments we are your children growing up in faith that are called to turn to you and pray the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us And lead us not into temptation, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are many ways to praise God. One of them is through prayer. But there's also an opportunity to praise God in giving and receiving. In this moment, we meditate on both as we prepare to give in gratitude for that which we have received from God. We have an opportunity to share God's blessings with others. I would invite you to do so as our ushers come forward to wait upon you. Please rise as you're able as we sing the doxology.
Let us pray. God, bless these gifts that they may be shared in the spirit of being Easter people, of being people who believe and people who are always going to be seeking ways to live out our faith as a way to serve you. Amen. And you may be seated. Scripture lesson this morning I'm going to read to you from the message, John 10, 11 through 21. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifices himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf come and runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He's only in it for the money. The sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and my own sheep know me. In the same way, the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I put the sheep before myself sacrificing myself if necessary. You need to know that I have other sheep in addition to those in this pen. I need to recognize and bring them too. They'll also recognize my voice. Then it will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me because I freely lay down my life. And so I am free to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own free will. I have the right to lay it down. I also have the right to take it up again. I receive this authority personally from my father. This kind of talk caused another split in the Jewish ranks. A lot of them were saying he's crazy, a maniac, out of his head completely. Why bother listening to him? But others weren't so sure. These aren't the words of a crazy man. Can a maniac open blind eyes? Here ends the reading of God's holy word.
Thank you very much. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations that are on the hearts of all of us, O oh God, be acceptable unto you. For you are our strength and you are our redeemer. Amen. Every once in a while, when I have been out and about in the world running errands or just encountering people that have no idea who I am or what I do, likewise, I don't know anything about them, but if I build up a conversation with them or attempt to, eventually somebody says something like this, where'd you come from? Now, <laughs> For those of you who may not have an appreciation for my level of humor, the desire within me is to answer that in all kinds of ways. It's just my humor. And so I, I always try to be professional and say, well, I grew up in this area of the state of Illinois, da 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 well, did you go anywhere else? Did you, did you, is that where you came from? I said, that's where I left. <laughs> and that's how I have put it. So let me just show you a couple of things. Not that any of you have asked where I have come from, but you do in really nice professional ways, in a different way. So if you would put up the first slide, Trevor, I would appreciate that. It's at a distance, but that whole block extending to my right, to your left, even is a part of the United, First United Methodist Church in Marshall, Illinois. And that as I grew up as a child going there, as a teenager going there, as a young adult going there, and even beginning my teaching life, coming back, going there. That is also the place for which I answered the call to ministry and had their pastor parish committee, which is the process, give the first approval. Doesn't look much different than any other church probably, other than by color. But once one got inside, it transformed, at least me. If you go to the second slide. That church in the sanctuary has four of those large stained glass windows. And smaller ones, still large in my mind, but smaller ones, but it was that window that it didn't matter where anyone sat in the sanctuary, they could always feel as if the eyes of Jesus holding that lamb were literally on them. No matter where I sat in that sanctuary, the way it's put together. And I suppose in some ways, if the truth were known, and if I went into therapy, <laughs> I don't know if you've moved me there yet, but if I went in to see a therapist along the way, they would probably say something like, well, tell me about your childhood. That's where they always start. And, and this would be a part of my childhood, which probably transferred to why one of many, but one reason why I felt like this sanctuary was so incredibly rich. Because you see, those stained glass windows then and now offer a world of wisdom, a world of history. I didn't know anything other than those stained glass windows where I grew up. But it seemed to me to be the, the real truth of what it means to be a follower of Christ, particularly the one that you just saw. 
It's a small wonder that the image of the shepherd was frequently upon the lips of the Savior. It was a part of his heritage, his culture. Think about it. Abraham, the father of the nation, was the keeper of great flocks, the scriptures say. Moses tended the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro when God called him into special service. David was the shepherd boy called in from fields to the king of Israel. The imagery of the shepherd was also imprinted in the literature of the day. You all know this one, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. And when Isaiah spoke of the coming of the Messiah, he worded it by saying, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. Now he's referring to Jesus. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather his lambs into his arms. Can you flash back to that stained glass for a moment, Trevor? in his arms, and it's at a distance, but that Jesus is holding a lamb with other lambs gathered around him. Jesus once told a story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, but one of them went astray, and in our way of thinking, a 99% return on our investment would be desirable. But Jesus, let go of the 99 to go in search of that one lost sheep. Later, when Jesus was speaking to a great throng of people, Mark tells us that he had compassion upon them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Throughout the Judeo-Christian faith, the image of the shepherd has been truly stamped upon our thinking in the church. But for me, it was stamped upon my thinking as a child. Honestly, I could not wait as a child to get into that sanctuary. The opening exercises in Sunday school, is what it was called then, was okay, but that wasn't what drew me there. It was the beauty and seeing that there was a picture of a man that I learned about his name being Jesus that would hold and comfort even a lamb. And then as I grew in understanding to think that all of the lambs are of value to God, oh my goodness, that is, in my understanding, a shepherd's love. One of the things that fascinates me is to see how Jesus looked at people. And I made reference to wherever I sat in that sanctuary, that particular stained glass, Jesus seemed to be looking at me. But Jesus, in his day, didn't see nameless faces, bland personalities, a bunch of hang-ups. He saw people as sheep. Now, most of us in this culture can't appreciate perhaps what that really means because we don't have an agricultural background. But in his day, shepherding shepherding was altogether different than what we might think of it. The shepherd knew each one of his sheep by name and had one job, and that one job was to provide for the sheep and to protect the sheep. The very existence of a shepherd depended upon the care and the leadership of the shepherd, and that helps you to understand perhaps the verse out of Matthew that says, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Now, on the farm where I lived, my father 
always had at least, at least 200 head of registered Hereford cattle. What was more important was they were horned Herefords. That means they had the ability to turn their head and knock you into the place they wanted you to be. And then he vacillated. Sometimes he would have pigs. And then he would sell the pigs off. They were feeder pigs. And after he would do that, he would buy sheep. That was my introduction to the live, liveliness of sheep. And I learned, I learned quickly. I really didn't care for pigs. I just want you to know that. They, you can tell me everything wonderful about them in the world, and I will be patient and kind, but don't ask me to care about them. But lambs and sheep were something else. I watched them. It was my job to move them from field to field based upon how far down they had cut the special alfalfa that had been grown for them. And I discovered firsthand that sheep are not very intelligent. In fact, their IQ might be some of the lowest of all the creatures that God ever created. They just don't get it. They literally don't get it. You cannot drive them. It was a good teaching tool for me because I learned by working with them that there are similarities to people. You can't drive them either. You can't. You can beg and plead and actually try to even pay, barter with them, but you can't drive people. You lead them. You lead them. And where that shepherd or where that worker leads, they follow behind. It's an amazing operation. But if you leave them alone, they just really don't get it. And maybe that's the reason why Jesus said the sh people need a shepherd. They don't get it sometimes. Sheep will stay in the same spot and eat and eat right where they are and eat until there is totally barren soil. They've eaten it all, but they haven't figured out they need to move. Mm -hmm. That's why the shepherd comes along and leads them. It's amazing. They will actually lay down and roll. Now, the sheep, I, I assume you knew this, are covered with wool. And periodically you have to shave that wool off. That's an exciting adventure. I'm sorry, most of you have never had that. But if you don't, they become dangerous to themselves. You see, they'll lay down and and trying to scratch because that wool becomes thick and matted with bugs and everything else, and they'll end up on their back. But here, here is the truth. They don't know how to get off their back. They don't. They just end up on their back with all four feet in the air. I didn't say anything, I really didn't, when as a district superintendent in meeting with a pastors, every pastor, and listening to them, this one pastor actually said to me, I know that I'm to shepherd the sheep, but I just can't get my sheep to listen to me. Now, to whom was he referring? His congregation. And I said, because the image of sheep came to my mind, that's the words that he had used, those are the words. I said, so what are they, just stuck on their back? And he said, what? <laughs> Obviously, he didn't know much about sheep either. But Jesus says, that the job of the shepherd 
I love this, in the 23rd Psalm, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, still waters. When you allow the Lord to become your shepherd, you can read his word for guidance and you can actually talk to him and ask him for direction and he promises that he'll lead you, lead you where he wants you to go, lead you. Hear that. That's different than being driven or trying to drive a ministry team or trying to cause something to happen. The Lord leads. But if we don't know the Lord's voice, we'll never know where he wants us to go. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus repeats something in this passage of the scripture four times. Four different times he says, lay down his life for his sheep. He's not just a shepherd. He's not even the shepherd. He is a good shepherd. Sheep, you see, are totally defenseless apart from the shepherd. Think about it. Dogs can bite. Cats can claw. Skunks can spray. But sheep can't do anything. They need protection, and that's the job of the shepherd. And it's hard work. Keep in mind that that's the promise. Your Lord, my Lord, the images of him in this church or in any stained glass is that he is the good shepherd. And the word good doesn't just mean nice or effective. The word literally means one of a kind in a class all by itself. Do you know what a good shepherd always does for the sheep? He always does what is best for the sheep. And sometimes that even means creating difficulties, problems, tragedies, trouble. But because Jesus is the good shepherd, we can always know that no problem that we might run into is bigger than the God that is above me and within me. The shepherd who gave his life for us also comes back from the dead, proves that he conquered death. He can conquer anything. That good old faithful line, with God all things are possible, fully dependent upon what kind of a relationship you and I have with the good shepherd. But every shepherd needs to have a few components. And one of them is leadership. We speak when we talk about appointments, clergy, going to churches. The conversation is always around what gifts do they have. And one of those gifts is leadership. Everybody wants good leadership. Everybody wants that. But the problem is, we all define it in different ways. That's where we get into trouble. Instead of looking at what does God call good leadership? Good shepherds lead us in and out of green pastures. And Good shepherds develop a sense of trust that the shepherd has with us and we have with the shepherd. And more than any other goal, the shepherd's role, remember, is to protect the sheep. Yes. So leadership is a component 
that every church in the work that I did that I wish would say up front, we need somebody who is a solid, strong leader. Not somebody who will run over us, but someone who will lead, who will be visionary, will cast a vision and can articulate that vision and most of all, love us. Because you see, the truth is, wherever we are, we're a quirky bunch of people. That's the truth. Think about it. There are more people outside of the church today than there are inside. We are the exception. So leadership is extremely critical. I love the fact that there was a good shepherd that as a child I could trust and believe in that picture of that stained glass that no matter what came to me during that week, there would be a Jesus that would still pick me up and love me. I hope you get that today. But we also need more than that. We need a shepherd that has the components of leadership. And what are those? You need a shepherd who has courage. They're walking ahead. As I have said to somebody periodically, different people, when they say, well, do you think anybody will show up for this? Do you think anybody will come for this? Da -da 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 -da. And, and my response is, well, I don't know if anybody's going to show up on Sunday, but I still get prepared. Think about it. There's a matter of trust. There's a matter of living with faith. And a leader has to have that. That's courage. A leader needs to have a spirit of nonconformity. Simply swimming with the tide leaves you nowhere. It may mean making difficult choices. It may mean looking for a different path. But a leader also needs to have foresight the ability to look ahead and see what's coming, and steadiness, having patience and persistence despite failures and obstacles. They keep showing up. They keep following through. And finally, I believe a leader, a good shepherd, has the trait of righteousness, the willingness to do the right thing and speak the truth when it may not be the truth for some, but is committed to doing what it is that God has called them to do. These are all the marks of a true leader, a good shepherd. And so, the good shepherd is so filled with the desire to do good for everyone that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And you can't argue about that. That's true leadership. We will all spend our lives trying to be imitators of Christ, whether we are leaders or whether we're followers. But when life begins to pinch, we all want a leader, a shepherd to lead us, someone we can trust, someone who has our best interest at heart, someone who has no intention of disappointing, somebody that says through the way they live, the way they speak, I offer you Christ. He is the good shepherd, not the pastor. He is the good shepherd. So the construct, the foundation of your faith, sets firmly upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. He is your good shepherd. Amen. Now, to leave you with one image, 
one image because I really want you to have this stick with you. Trevor, let's try this video and see if it shows up well. Now tell me, who is here that does not want that kind of a good shepherd pulling them out of the culverts of life? Amen. Please rise as you are able as we sing verses 1 through 3, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. God gives life, God renews life, and God is life. Celebrate the life within you and let it overflow into the world. And may the peace of God dwell within you this week and forevermore as you share what it means to have a good shepherd. Amen. Go in peace. See you next Sunday. I never